and pleasant Sabbath and welcome to Laventon Seventh-day Adventist Church. I hope that you're blessed. We invite you to sit back, relax and invite a friend. This morning's broadcast is about to begin. Oh,
hymn number 373, as we fellowship this morning, Seeking the Lost, our main mission, hymn number 373. church very happy to be here with you all this morning due to the cause of uh, technology to remind I'm away from home I'm very thankful that I could be taking part in the Sabbath school this morning so just listen carefully as I try to give this rendition <laughs>
Hi, pleasant Sabbath, everyone. It is so great to have you here with us today as we continue another lesson. This week, we had a very interesting lesson. This is lesson five, and it's entitled Spirit Empowered Witnessing. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes as we pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for having us here today to minister dear God. Be with us in a special way as we look into your word and the specific lessons that are brought for us to understand the workings of the Holy Spirit in our witnessing. The Lord be with each one of us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So our scripture reading is taken from Acts 4.31, which says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. When Jesus commanded the early believers to go into all the world and preach the gospel, it must have seemed like an impossible mission. How could they ever accomplish such a huge challenge? Their numbers were so small. Their resources were limited. They were a largely uneducated band of ordinary believers, but they had an extraordinary God who would empower them for their extraordinary mission. Jesus declared, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The empowering of the Holy Spirit would enable the believers to share the message of the cross with life-changing, world-changing power. The Holy Spirit made their witness effective. In a few short decades, the gospel impacted the entire world. Acts declares that these early believers turned the world upside down. The Apostle Paul adds that the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven. In this week's lesson, we will especially focus on the role of the Holy Spirit in empowering our witness for Christ. Well, Spirit Empowered Witnessing is our lesson for this week. And it says here, how does the Holy Spirit, how is the Holy Spirit related to witnessing? Well, without the Spirit, witnessing is barren because it cannot produce fruit for eternal life. That is why Jesus ordered his disciples to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit before beginning their witnessing work. How does the Holy Spirit make witnessing effective? Well, these are the ways, and I want you to remember them. How many we have here? We have about five. So firstly, the Holy Spirit, we are just going to reference him as he. He, the Holy Spirit, prepares the witness. He produces the growth. He strengthens and guides and he gives the word, and then he transforms. So let me see if you remember these. Prepares the witness, produces growth, strengthens and guides, gives the word, and finally transforms. So we're going to look at each of these facets. Firstly, the first one is he prepares the witness. It says in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Before his ascension, Jesus promised that a helper, Paracletos, would come, the Holy Spirit. He would help us to carry out the mission Jesus commended us to do. What does the Holy Spirit do specifically? Well, he does a lot of things. Firstly, he walks with us. He does what? He walks with us. Then he prepares us to be a witness. Then he leads us in our task. Then he opens the hearts to the gospel. Then he gives us the right words. Then he convinces people. Then he encourages us to testify. Then 
He shows us the right opportunities. Then he reveals Jesus. And finally, he transforms us to his image. So you see the type of work that the Holy Spirit does is that he comes and guides us. He walks with us. He prepares us to be a witness. He leads us onto the tasks that we have been commanded to do. And then he opens the hearts to receive the gospel. He gives us the right tools, the words to say, the text to preach. He convinces those who are listening to what we have to say. And he encourages us, despite what, to continually testify of God's goodness. And then he shows us the right opportunity. This is a golden moment to spread the word. And then he reveals Jesus in our actions and all endeavors to those listening so they can be convinced. And he transforms us, each one of us, to God's image. Witnessing is to collaborate with the Holy Spirit. What is witnessing? To collaborate with the Holy Spirit. The next thing is that he prepares us, then he does what? He produces growth. It says in Acts 2 47, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The Acts of the Apostles tells the work of the Holy Spirit to those who let him work in their lives. On occasion, there were mass conversions, like 3,000 or 5,000 people, as stated in Acts 2.41 and Acts 4.4. Whole families were converted sometimes, as stated in Acts 10.44-48. New local churches were founded continuously because of this growth in Acts 16.5. The Spirit filled the messages with power and touched every heart that heard about the gospel. Every person is important to God. He died for each and every one. He wants everyone to know about him and accept him. He has chosen us to do his work. Fine, next step. So he prepares, produces, and strengthens and guides. He never leaves us alone. Because it says in Acts 16, 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Preaching the gospel is not a problem-free task. However, the Spirit strengthens his servants as he did with Stephen and Paul and Silas. Acts 7, 5, 5 and 16, 25. He brings walls down and maintains the church united. As he did in Acts 11, 15 and 15, 28. You see here, he also leads us to the right places. And people in a supernatural way, opening and closing the appropriate doors. Thanks to his work, the gospel could be preached in Africa and Europe. The Holy Spirit longs to empower us, strengthen us, teach us, guide us, unify us, and send us out on the most important mission in the world, which is leading men and women to Jesus and his truth. He gives the word. So we had prepares, produces strengths and guides, and then gives the word. Many of those who heard the word believe, Acts 4, 4. The Spirit encourages us to base our testimony in the word of God. We view the following examples. Here we have Acts 2, 14, 21. In this story, Peter quoted Joel and Psalms in his Pentecostal, Pentecost speech. Then in Acts 7, Stephen used the story of Israel in his speech before the Sahedra. Then in Acts 8, 35, Philip began with a verse from Isaiah and went over the whole Bible. And then here, Acts 17, 3, Paul based his speeches in the word of God. The word of God has power to change lives because the Holy Spirit inspired its authors. The same Holy Spirit is touching the heart of every sincere reader today. So we have, he prepares, produces, strengths, and guides, gives the word, and transforms us. First Samuel 10, 6 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. The Holy Spirit uses people as they are. He breaks prejudices down, transforms their bad habits, and fills them with Christ's grace and truth. He makes no distinction between men or women, rich or poor, 
cultured or uncultured. You see, he transforms Lydia, a seller of purple in Acts 16, 14 to 15, on a same Onesimus, I, I always get mixed up with this word. I'll get it eventually. He was a slave, as stated in Philippians 10, and Sergius, a Roman governor in Acts 13, 6 to 12, and Diocinus, and Ariel Pagite in Acts 17, 34. In all these lessons, you see here, Lydia was converted, and then the slave, and then the Roman governor, and then Aero Guide. And these were all people of rich influence, and somehow they were touched and reached by the Holy Spirit. But the one of them was a slave. So it shows there was no partiality in who received this message, both rich and poor, poor governor, slave, business person, or a socialite. No matter what walk of life they were from, the Holy Spirit transformed them. Amen? The Holy Spirit is powerful today as he was then. He still works miracles by transforming all kinds of people. Our work is not to change or convert people. That's the Holy Spirit. We've been called to be witnesses. As we close, we will read from Selected Messages, Book 1, Chapter 37, page 263. And let's read together. It says, we are to bear as definite a testimony to the truth as it is in Jesus, as the Christ and his apostles, trusting in the efficiency of the Holy Spirit. We are to testify of the mercy, goodness, and love of a crucified and risen Savior, and thus be agents through whom the darkness will be dispelled from many minds and cause thanksgiving and praise to ascend from many hearts to God. There is a great work to be done by every son and daughter of God. Folks, we are grateful for this opportunity to understand the working of the Holy Spirit, who prepares, produces, strengthens, and guides, gives the word, and transforms us. Let us pray, continually pray, and ask that as we go on our spiritual endeavors of witnessing, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to grab those opportunities and be given the word so that others may receive it. Let us continue to acknowledge the work of the Holy Spirit in our ministry. Let us bow our heads and close our eyes to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for studying again. Dear Lord, be with us as we are commissioned to do this great and mighty work in these times particularly to preach the gospel. Let the Holy Spirit empower each one of us that we will speak your words, dear God, that we will be able to provide hope and bring people to the light out of darkness so that they will understand that there is only one way, God's way to eternal life. Dear Lord, be with each one of us, bowing here, listening, tuning, viewing. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Joshua is 11 years old and lives in Croatia, a country in Eastern Europe. From the time he was a baby, Joshua's parents took him to Sabbath school. And long before he went to school, Joshua was already playing the violin. For as long as he can remember, he's had two great loves, God and his violin. When Joshua was eight years old, he went to Vacation Bible School, or VBS, for the first time. He loved every aspect of it, especially when he could play his violin. The next year, Joshua invited friends from the village primary school and from his music school. You must come, it's great, he told them. Joshua also talked with them about God, but they didn't seem to care too much about that. They still came to VBS and liked it. The following year, Joshua's friends wanted to come again. And this time, one girl, after listening to the children's sermon at VBS, told Joshua, This is a miracle. There really is a God. Joshua told her that God is near to her and all of us. The girl asked him for a Bible and soon received one. Now she and her mom are going to Pathfinders, and her mother also goes to a women's group at the church. One day when Joshua was 11, he heard his parents talking about a boy who was very sick. The boy had a brain tumor, and his family couldn't afford to pay for the operation that he needed. I know what we can do, Joshua said. We can have a concert to help raise money to help this boy. Okay, his mom said, but she was wondering how she could possibly organize it. That wasn't a problem, however, because Joshua organized everything himself. He told his friends at the music school about his idea, and soon 15 young musicians were eager to help by playing the concert. Joshua also talked with an Adventist pastor who was willing to present short devotionals between each of the 15 musical pieces. Soon, posters advertising the special benefit concert were seen all over the village of Marushevek and at schools in the area, inviting people to come to this special program. The concert was held at the Seventh-day Adventist Church on the campus of the Adventist Secondary School in Marushevek. About 300 people came to the concert, and most had never been in an Adventist church. Joshua and his friends were delighted when they learned that their concert raised 8,600 Croatian kunas. That's more money than an average person in Croatia makes in a whole month. Even though Joshua and his friends didn't personally know the sick boy, they were happy that they were able to help him and his family. Joshua is happy to use his love for God and violin to share God's love with as many people as he can. Now Joshua is planning more concerts to help other children in need. Who knew that a boy and his violin could make such an impact? Imagine what you could do to help people around you.
Jean saw the lion lay down by the lamb. I want to know everything about that land. Jean saw the day, but he did not see night. The lamb of God, well, he must be the light. And he saw the saints worship the great I am, crying worthy, worthy. everyone and pleasant sabbath these are your announcements for sabbath the first of august 2020 and we want to wish a special emancipation day to all though we don't celebrate uh, what the world celebrates we know that on this sabbath day god has purchased us and we are free and free indeed so every sabbath we should celebrate emancipation day so here we go with this week's announcements. We want to wish a special happy birthday to Brother Kareem Franklin. Today is your birthday, a high day in Israel. Happy birthday, my brother, and congrats to the newlyweds as we go. Read to me. This summer, take time to read with your children, purchase over $300, and get free crayons and a coloring book from the Ayapa Bookstore in San Fernando and Port of Spain and St. Augustine. 20% off all children's books, both in English and Spanish. And you can get more information at the Ayapa Bookstore Trinidad on Facebook. That is the Ayapa Bookstore Trinidad on Facebook. Be a youth literature evangelist this summer. Get the money you need for school fees, school books, uniforms, saving and investments. Learn communication and social skills. Learn to share your faith and make new friends. Contact the publishing ministry at 290-7934. That is 290-7934 to be a youth literature evangelist 
the publishing ministries. We are more than just books. We are a lifestyle. Personal Ministries Association and the Publishing Ministries present Hope in the Midst of Chaos by Mark Finley. Join the Reading and Prayer Initiative that started on Sunday, the 26th of July, and it runs every Sunday at 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. It's on Zoom. The ID is 467-482-3792, and the password is 715-843. That is ID 467-482-3792. And the password, 7153483. Youth Week of Prayer 2020, youth leaders and officers, please be advised that due to unforeseen circumstances, the video representations of the Youth Week of Prayer readings 2020 will not be available via the SEC YouTube channel as previously advertised. As a result, we are requesting that churches have youth members of your congregation present the readings during your physical and virtual church services. Thank you for understanding, and we anticipate your usual cooperation. In Park Trinidad and Tobago, Experience the Fire presenters, SEC pastors and lay preachers, guest speakers, Pastor Tony Mapp, Dr. Sherwin Jack, Dr. Balvin Braham, Pastor Inskip Richards, Pastor Earl Baldwin, Dr. Sam Samuel Telemach. Pastor James Janssen, Pastor Sherwin White, and our convention speaker will be our very own Pastor Nigel Walcott, Personal Ministries and Community Services Director of the South Caribbean Conference, the venue Arima SDA Church, Pastor Walcott did pastor our church in the past, August 14th, August 29th, 2020, and Net 2020 Christ for the Crisis with Pastor Inskip Richards, September 26th to October 17th, 2020. Every week we present Worship Wednesday, 6 p.m. on our YouTube channel. Worship Wednesday at 6 p.m. on our YouTube channel. Come and tune in to soul-inspired singing, spiritual, uh, spiritually uplifting preaching, and you can come and hear a word from Jesus. That is Worship Wednesday, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. on our YouTube channel. Join us for Bible study. At, also at 6 p.m., Mondays and Wednesdays, on our YouTube channel, that is. Join us for Bible study, Mondays and Wednesdays at 6 p.m., on our YouTube channel. Come and study the Bible and find out more about the last days, about the sanctuary service, and about other things that take place in the Bible. That is, Mondays and Wednesdays, on our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is teeming with content. Minister into Lavendale in these last days, 6 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays on our YouTube channel, as well as the Minister into Lavendale in these last days YouTube channel. So you can go on to YouTube, type in Minister into Lavendale in these last days, and on Tuesday and Thursday at 6 p.m., you will see our pastor, Pastor Keshford Frank, conduct his podcast. It is thoroughly fascinating. I recommend it fully. Tune in and learn more about ministering to love until in these last days. These were your announcements for Sabbath, the 1st of August, 2020. We do hope that you are safe, sanctified, and sanitized. God bless you, and have a great day.
how you're hurting. Well, you see, he knows just how your heart has been broken in two. He's a God of the stars, of the sun, and the seas, and he is our Father. You know, he can calm the storm, and he'll find some way to fix it for you. For my illustration but that's fine so but you know you know that now if i get it that's fine but my title is keep your fox <laughs> it sounds weird uh. what did i say very good keep your fox Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14. Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14. For that says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Another version says, expected end. Verse 12, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. 
I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried uh, away captive. The circumstances of our lives sometimes contradict the intentions of God for our lives. Let me, let me, let me state it again. Sometimes the conditions we find ourselves in in this world seem to go contrary to the, the promises God has made for us. Are, are we together now? We have the promise of honey. Huh? The land flowing with milk and honey. We have the promise of honey. But truth be told, some of us live on sour cream and bitter leaves. Are we, are we together? We have the promise of outpouring from the windows of heaven. Am I talking truth? But some of us live on hand-me-down and handouts. We have the promise of uh, inheriting the promised land. But truth be told, some of us are living in the wilderness. If God be for us, uh, why are we the target, target of hardship, headaches, and heartbreaks? Why do the followers of Christ sometimes have such a tough time in this world? If God be for us, why do we have to endure so much pain and suffering and misery and shame and sorrow and sadness and crime and violence and poverty and hunger and loneliness and homelessness and injustice and corruption and terrorism and abductions and wars and disasters and calamities and, and even captivity? If God be for us, why do we feel so alone and lonely in this world? Why do we feel like a motherless child a long way from home? These were Judas' questions as they sat, as they sat in downtown Babylon waiting for deliverance to go back home to Jerusalem. Judah is in Babylon, in captivity. And they are in Babylon and they are questioning God. The occasion of our text was the captivity of Judah in Babylon. Like the captured Nigerian schoolgirls waiting for deliverance and feeling despondent. Judah was cracking at the seams under the weight of guilt and shame compounded by hopelessness and helplessness. Judah was on the verge of giving up on faith and hope and living. So despondent, they were ready to give up on life and living and believing and even marrying and raising children. False prophets... Hananiah and Shemaiah told them their deliverance will be sooner than the 70 years Jeremiah was predicting. So they literally put their lives on hold, waiting to go back home soon. Which meant no schooling, no business, no working, no marrying, no building, no farming. No fishing, just sitting there wasting their lives. And mourning and waiting for speedy return back to Canaan. They even give up singing. Have you given up hope yet? Here is their own testimony. I'm talking about God's people. God's children. Here is their own testimony, Psalm 137. It says, by the rivers of Babylon, 
there we sat down. Yeah, yeah means yes, we wept. When we remembered Africa, I mean Zion. <laughs> we hang our haps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away, our oppressors, those who oppressed us, carried us away captive, required of us a song. And they that wasted us, required of us myrrh, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And we responded, how, 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 how? How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? It doesn't feel like home. I don't care how, 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 how joyful and how happy we can be. This world doesn't feel like home. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They refuse to hope and live. Things got so bad. That God had to send them a letter. Uh, and literally, I mean, letter from heaven by Jeremiah to tell them to go ahead and live. Make a living. Marry. And raise kids in Babylon. Yes, in Babylon. Yes, in Trinidad. <laughs> Marry and raise kids in Babylon and pray for the city in which you live. Jeremiah 29, verse 4, thou says the Lord, the letter, thou says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, immigrants, whom I have caused, I, God, have caused you to be in captivity, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. That's God's letter from heaven. Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there and not diminish, and seek the peace. Of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. And Ezekiel 37 verse 11 gives us a sneak preview of what was spiritually happened to Judah in Babylon. Then he said unto me, son of man, God is talking to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, you know the condition of your people in Babylon. You know what's going on uh, with them. I want to tell you what is actually going on with them spiritually. And so, and so Ezekiel 7, uh, 37, 11, uh, thou says, uh, uh, then he, God said unto me, son of man, Ezekiel, these bones are the whole house of Israel. These bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, look, they say our bones are dried. We're tired. We're hopeless. We have no more hope. We've given up. Our bones are dried. And then, and then, and then what, what, are they, what, what is really going on with them? And our hope is lost. And we are cut off for our parts. But why? Why did Israel give up on hope? Because Israel reasoned that their temporal situation in Trinidad, no, I mean Babylon, <laughs> was an indication of God's ultimate intention for them. Did you catch it? Their temporal situation in Babylon was an indication of God's ultimate intention for them. So if they are suffering in Babylon, it means God didn't care. The reason that their suffering was an indication that God had rejected them. 
unfortunately, like Judas, some of us are plagued with a simplistic view of things that says if things go well, God is with us. But if things go wrong, God is not with us. And since things have not gone all that well with us, therefore, God must not be with us, nor for us. And if God is not with us, then there is no reason to live. There is no reason to hope. There is no reason to dream. And so we give up on faith. So God had to send them a letter of hope to tell them to persevere in the face of trouble and never give up on hope and never give up on faith and never give up on living for I know the thoughts I think towards you says the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope so when things are not going well, even when things are not going well, don't give up. Because God's thoughts for you are good. Just, 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 just because things have gone wrong, you've been sick, I, and even sinned, and been poor, and single, or divorced, or abused, or victimized, or immigrant, or lost loved one, does not mean God has given up on you, or abandoned his children. He promised never to leave us, nor to forsake us. He promised never to break his covenant with your father Abraham. Because your father is Abraham and God's covenant will never be broken with Abraham. You are still God's child and God will never abandon his children. He promised to save all those who come to God through Jesus. He promised when the road is rough and the going is tough. Uh, he will be with us. All the way. Like the song says, all the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercies? Who through life has been my guide? Oh, he promised to be with us in the fire. Am I talking truth? He promised to be with us in the fire. And in the flood. And in the storm. Your crucible is not for your crucifixion, but for your redemption. He promised never to leave us, nor forsake us. And, and it's not for your, your crucible is not for your failure, but for your refinement. We must go through the fire not to die, but to be refined. Like gold tried in the fire. So even though we have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil. For he has promised he shall be with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. And then he, he, and then he gave us assurance. He said, surely, surely, guaranteed, goodness. I don't know about you, but goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So if you feel like Judah in Babylon and all you see around you is trouble and you find and, 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 and find your difficult circumstances contradicting your theological conviction of hope and you are tempted to give up. I have a letter from heaven. From the Lord. Uh, that says, don't give up. If you feel like Judah in Babylon. And all you see around you is sickness. And you are sick and tired of prescriptions and medications. Do I have a witness? 
and, 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 and you are sick and tired of doctors and nurses and painkillers and side effects. Sometimes you go to the doctor and what they give you is worse than what you have. They give you a medicine that will give you a side effect that will kill you. And if you are sick and tired of all these stuff and you are tempted to give up, I got a letter from heaven. And he says, hold on. Don't give up. And so if you feel like Judah in Babylon, and all you see are, are financial troubles, and, and you are getting tired of credit card bills, and debts, and interest rates, and poverty, and school fees, and mortgage payments, and high rent, and homelessness, and you are tempted to give up. I got a letter for you. A letter from the Lord. A letter from heaven. That says, I, got it. I, I know the thoughts I have for you. They are thoughts of good and not evil. Don't give up. If you feel like Judah in Babylon, and all you see around you are economic troubles, immigration issues and bureaucracies and political hypocrisy and and like and like and 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 and, and you feel like a uh, path to and i hear to i understand that you, you some some people not everybody is citizen and some of you need papers am i talking to you? and your path to citizenship is slipping away and you are about to give up i have a letter from heaven uh, it says don't give up uh, keep holding on if you are like Judah in Babylon and all you see around you are perennial marital problems and you get a big pillow in your bedroom oh lord help us <laughs> you get, a, you get, a, you get a, a pillow that looks like a mountain <laughs> and that won't go away <laughs> And, and, and so like Judah in Babylon, you feel like throwing in the towel and about to give up on your marriage uh, and stop singing and give up on God and give up on church and give up hope. God says, hold on, don't give up. And the song says, though darkness seemed to veil his face. That I can see his face. There's between me and him. There's clouds of darkness. Between me and God. And so darkness seemed to veil his face. Then, then I have to remind myself. That he is God. And he doesn't change. And even though I can see him. He's still there. He says even though darkness seemed to veil his face. I will rest on his unchanging grace. He said, I, I know the thoughts I have for you. They are thoughts of good and not of evil. I haven't changed my mind. I still love my children. It was I that sent my son to come die for you. Do you think I am going to send my son to die for you to waste his blood? And if I send my son to die for you, I'm going to make sure I save you into my kingdom. So you will never give up. Can somebody say Amen. Your situation, uh, your situation may not look good right now. Uh, your diagnosis does not give, lend itself to good prognosis. But God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. God says, your present outlook may be dark, but your future prospect is bright. I know the thoughts I think towards you. So, 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 so Judah in Babylon. Uh, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 10, for thou sayest the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you. And perform my good word towards you. And cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts I think towards you. 
Job understood this. That Christianity is not a bed of roses. That's why when everybody, including his wife, tried to discourage him, he stood his ground and said, I may not feel the promise now. My circumstances may contradict my theology, my theology right now. I may not have all the blessings God promised to me now, but I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon this earth. And though after my skin worm destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Ah, your situation may be dark right now. But God says your future is bright. Joseph might not have understood everything he was going through in Egypt. But he had enough spiritual sense to wait on the Lord. Joseph had dreams of becoming prominent in the family. But look at him now. His brothers hated him and sold him and left him for dead and forgot all about him. He was put in the pit, sold to Ishmaelites, ended up in Egypt, lied about, sent to jail to rot in the Egyptian dungeon. But he never wavered. He never wavered in faith. He waited on the Lord. For they that wait on the Lord. Oh, they shall renew their strength. Hey, at long last, God's time came for Joseph. He may not come when you want him, but he is always on time when you need him. At the appointed time, Joseph was delivered and raised to the Egyptian throne, second in command to Pharaoh. It's no secret what my God can do. So brethren, it may not look good for you now, but if you can hold on. He says, I know the thoughts I think towards you. Says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an everlasting future. When you can see your way clear. Trust in God's wisdom. And accept his care. We may not understand what he is doing right now. But in the end. It will all work together. For the good of God's children. Can you say amen? It may get ugly. Before it gets good. But it will get good anyhow. So hear what the song says. I've been reading in the Bible about the ending of the age. And one thing that's for certain, it grows closer every day. But I am not concerned about the way it's going to end. Because I've read the back of the book. And we win. No more living in darkness. We'll be living at home with him. You see, there's no need to worry about it if you are born again. I have read the back of the book and we win. Love and tell, it may not look good for some of you right now. But, 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 but I just want to let you know I have read the back of the book. And I'm laughing because Jesus wins at the end. And we win with Jesus. I said the meek shall inherit the earth. Like Judah in Babylon, we may be held captive against our wills by poverty or sickness or sin or Satan in the middle of the book. But I have read the back of the book and Babylon, that oppressive power is no more. I have read the back of the book and even the Persia is no more and Grecia is no more and Roman Empire is no more. And mighty British Empire is no more. Al-Qaeda, no more. Boko Haram, no more. Arm um, robbery, no more. ISIS, no more. Syria, no more. Iran, no more. Oh, America the Beautiful, no more. Even Trinidad. <laughs> no more. Where are God's captive people in Babylon? On the sea of glass. 
having the harps of God and singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Saying, great and marvelous are thy ways, Lord God Almighty. Where is Babylon, Revelation 18, 21? Under the sea. Under the sea. Babylon, under the sea. In the middle of the book, God's people are captives in Babylon. But at the back of the book, Babylon is no more. In the middle of the book, our outlook is dark. But at the back of the book, our future is bright. In the middle of the book, sickness ravaging our bodies. Huh? But at the back of the book, no more cancer. No more sickness. No more arthritis. No more diabetes. No more sin. Affliction shall never rise the second time. In the middle of the book, Satan reigns. Jesus dies. But at the back of the book, Jesus reigns. Satan burns. So when Satan oppresses you, in the middle of the book, show him his future. At the back of the book, he burns. Live your life not on the basis of the now. In the middle of the book. But on the basis of the outcome at the back of the book. I'm supposed to be crying for what I'm going through. But I have read the back of the book. That's why I am laughing. So don't judge me by your myopic, re uh, myopic reading of events in the middle of the book. I have read the back of the book. That's why I am happy in the midst of trouble. So like Judah in Babylon. Some of us may be crying now because of death or sickness or pain or loneliness or separation in the middle of the book. But I have read the back of the book. And behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away at the back of the book so let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus says. In my father's house, at the back of the book, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, at the back of the book. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Oh, so then you are asking the question, so, so where is the fork in, in all these things? A woman was diagnosed with a terminal illness and was given three months to live. Getting her house in order, she asked her pastor to come and discuss her final wishes. So she told, she told him which songs she wanted sung, scriptures read, and the outfit to wear. She requested to be buried with her favorite Bible. As the pastor prepared to leave, the woman exclaimed with excitement, One more thing, pastor. One more thing. What's that? The pastor asked. This is important, said the woman. I want to be buried with a fork in my hand. The pastor stood puzzled, not knowing what to say. The woman explained, in all my years of attending church socials and potluck dinners, when the dish of the main course were being cleared, someone will lean over and say, keep your fork. It was my favorite part of the meal. Because I knew something better was coming. 
like velvety chocolate cake or deep dish apple pie and ice cream. Something better was coming. So when people see me in the casket with a fork in my hand and ask you, what's with the fork? I want you to tell them to keep your fork for the best is yet to come. At the back of the book, we win. In the name of the Lord. In the name. So love and tell. Members, keep your fork. For the best is yet to come. Oh, I know the thoughts I think towards you. The thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. The best is yet to come. Like, like, like velvety chocolate cake or deep dish apple pie and heavenly prepared ice cream the best is yet to come or heavenly buns and veggie cheese and patties and sorrel no rum cake or oxtail or curry goat but the best is yet to come i'm gonna sit at a welcome table one of these days with jesus we're gonna eat and drink with jesus feast some milk and honey with jesus if all the best is yet to come so so i just came tonight to remind you and to tell you to keep your folks faithful cheerful joyful careful prayerful fruitful with smiles beautiful hands dutiful minds thoughtful hearts grateful souls graceful because god is merciful and wonderful so keep your forks i mean your faith for the best is yet to come trinidad keep your fork your faith in jesus your savior and be faithful to jesus your lord but keep your forks for the best is yet to come. Hallelujah. We want to give him praise tonight. Everyone are safe.
want to lift him up and praise him and give him all the glory for he's worthy. <laughs> Thank you.